members of the Ur societies, these barbarian tribal warlords and bands that start springing up all over the place. Uh, but within the mother body of, let's say, Western civilization, we've got neo-tribalism everywhere you look. You have L gangs in L.A., you have Hells Angels bikers, you have the mafia functioning in New York, you have all these disruptive cultures that function parasitically within the mother body of the main society because the main society, the, the overcoating regime of the dominant uh, sign regime isn't working for that society. Too many people are disenchanted with it, and so they're seceding from it to form their own culture. Mm -hmm. But to form your own culture, um, as a validly functioning culture within a host culture, you have to look at the semiotics there. You're in an immunologically dangerous situation. Because if you're inside, if your culture is inside of another culture, that other host culture's immune system is going to target you and is going to target you constantly until you either disappeared or separated off and become your own organism. And so these societies, these subversive cultures are constantly paranoid, they're constantly under threat of extermination, and they respond to that with constant violence and aggression. And the violence that they use is a way of creating a cultural boundary marker. They inscribe a mark on the socius of the body that they're a part of that serves as a, to, to function as a kind of boundary act that differentiates them and indicates that we have a separate set of cultural traits. And electronic dance music might be one of those cultural traits that demarcate this particular subversive group in opposition to the mother body. But they'll go on being violent until the, mo the mother body's immune system either consumes them or, uh, let's say, as in the case of the Maccabean revolt in the ancient world, they do manage to stand up for themselves and break away and form their own uh, state. And then they're up and running and they're a separate entity. This is just the way culture works in the age uh, of a Kali Yuga, in the age of cultural disintegration. There's always a, a mother body, uh, what can be called a universal state, and then subversive cultures popping up hither and yon who will begin to break away. So most of them will not succeed. Most of them will be eaten up by the phagocytes of the immune system of the mother body who will wipe them out of existence, but many of them will survive and they'll go on to become the founding, the sort of founding cells, as it were, of new and future culture. Mm. Um, another one of the things that I really admire about your work is you, you nothing is um, unacceptable to analyze from the mythical perspective and, and from an, an intense um, intellectual perspective. And I, I remember reading your um, essay on Grand Theft Auto and your thoughts on video games I just thought were so fascinating because they definitely um, tie into this. And I'm just curious, have any of your thoughts changed since um, that essay? And if so, how? And could you talk a bit about that? Because I definitely think it's one of the more fascinating stances um, that you have in your work. No, um, I still believe that video games, <clears throat> contrary to what the media say, are, are healthy to a certain extent. Uh, I mean, anything done in overdose, it, you know, everything in moderation. Right. But the, the, about video games is that what they teach is they give you the keys for the labyrinth. Every video game presupposes a kind of Kafkaesque labyrinth that you are trapped inside of, and that's always code for contemporary modern industrial civilization, which is a gigantic labyrinth uh, that is constantly coding the flows that go through it with checkpoints, uh, tests that you have to pass, ID that you have to have, tests, and, and so forth. And the video game is all code for that. And to get out of it, the video game gives you uh, the tools, it puts the tools in your hand, the game player's hands, to navigate your way through the labyrinth and to develop skills for tracing your own line of flight through the labyrinth to find a way out. And I think that the, vi the video games aren't the problem, they're an attempt at a solution to the problem. The problem is the overcoating of the civilization is so dominating and, and so overwhelming that it turns us all into, into the, the proverbial Kafkaesque protagonist, like in the trial, who gets stuck in a labyrinth and he, he has no tools to get to find his way out, and they take him out and back and, and stab him in the end. <laughs> but I think that with, with the video games, um, it does provide a kind of road map for people to uh, feel like they're actively participating in finding a way out. It scales up their sense of self-importance almost to the level of a two-dimensional giant human from the ancient epics of the past, and it gives them a sense that they can have an effect on the culture uh, by moving through it, by successfully navigating through the impossible grid and meshwork of the culture. I mean, if, you, if you're flying in an airplane and you look at the cities from the air, they look exactly like the kinds of things that you see on video games, these impossible 
to navigate networks. Yeah. Video games are kind of attempt at a solution to the problem. I don't see them as the problem. Hmm. I like that. That's a very uh, fascinating kind of point of view. I, I agree. I think that, and I think that like the t like TV and um, like graphic novels, there's definitely a potential for it to tell some really amazing interactive stories. And the, and the whole um, idea with the medium is that you're learning as you're interacting, and so it's it's kind of a two way street. It's a lot less of a passive thing um, than reading a book or, or watching a movie and I, I think that there is definitely a potential there too just like with indie titles and things it seems like indie games definitely um, can be as powerful it's just that they're not necessarily there or that there have been a few titles here and there that have that have um, kind of gone in the more arty sophisticated um, you know philosophical depth but the the mainstay again is the the transhuman influence, and with video game culture, you also have all of the really intense military inter in entertainment industrial complex funds that seem to be just you know channeling all of the the you know mega machine kind of tropes that you find, and and a, and a lot of the combine with machines so that you can become stronger and better and you know, your brain can function more accurately, so all, all that sort of stuff. But there definitely is a, a combating influence to that, too. Um, and uh, speaking sort of of the, the machine themes and transhumanism, um, I think that you've told me that the one of the next books that you're working on is um, sort of an archaeology of science fiction. Is that right? I'd like to hear a little bit more if you have kind of a preview for people who are looking forward to the next thing because it's one of the amazing things about you, John. You're just uh, really fast. I mean, you're amazing in terms of how <laughs> fast you, you put out work. It's just kind of mind-blowing. Um, I, I may or may not do the archaeology of science fiction next. I, I think I, I may go back to working on the, the subject of violence because uh, I've got some new ideas about that mm. and then set the uh, science fiction book aside and then get back. That's the way I work. I, I juggle three or four different books at the same time and then sort of work a little bit on one and then get back to it and then work a little bit on another and get back to it. And that's why I had three books published recently uh, in the space of one year because I've been working on all three of those books simultaneously for the past you know, five years. You remember me starting the graphic novel book back in uh, 08 or 09, I think. Yeah, it. yeah, uh, that's right. So, yeah, so, so the archaeology of science fiction, though, will be, when I, when I get back to it, uh, an attempt to go through uh, the grand cosmologies of you know, people like H.P. Lovecraft and, and Philip K. Dick and Isaac Asimov and Robert Heinlein and Frank Herbert and to uh, go through those cosmologies and to see why they formed, why it is that they formed. And I, I have a suspicion that they form in the age of the disintegration of, of, of a single macrosphere. A sin, to borrow a term from Peter Sloterdijk, a single functioning macrosphere that holds the culture together. In Dante's time, he didn't have to do this. When Dante constructed his journey through hell and then up through purgatory, through the outer spheres, all that was already up and running for him. All he had to do was provide uh, the reader with a narrative. But nowadays, there is no single agreed upon cosmology. It's in a state of disarray and chaos. So each one of these authors has to come up with an alternative cosmology. And the alternative cosmology is like it's like an age of competing cosmologies. Uh, Isaac Asimov comes up with the, you know the foundation cosmology, which is really code for the um, the projection of the American Empire, uh, America as a universal state onto the entire cosmos. Mm -hmm. Frank comes up with Dune, which is really a transplantation of Middle Eastern politics uh, to Cali cross with California ecological concerns, which is more imminental. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, Asimov is transcendental and is out there amongst the stars. Frank Herbert is burn, burrowing his mind down into the earth where he discovers these sandworms that appear as giants because he scaled himself down to the level of an ant. Mm -hmm. So forth. And, and just look at these different cosmologies and see how they function and what they do. So that'll be a plan for a future project. Uh, but right now I'm working on a book about violence um, and violent social formations, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I can definitely relate to juggling a bunch of things. I'm sure everyone in the information age can just, uh, you know, competing, I guess, ideas and subjects. And it, it seems uh, one of the ways to kind of take everything in is you almost have to kind of juggle and compare and sort of 
process different things and from different um, mediums and everything. All right, well, very interesting. I, I'm very curious about these future works, and thank you very much for talking to me about the current work. Um, again, you can buy John's new book um, on Amazon, um, and it, it really is an amazing uh, take on the graphic novel universe. I don't think anybody has really done anything quite like it. So I encourage everyone to go out and get that. And John, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. I know you're very busy. Yes, you're welcome. It's uh, been a pleasure being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.